now. All right, for the time being. Okay. Okay. Sorry, guys. I'm sure you were all listening into that. We just, it's just, it frustrates me that um, some of these community oncologists offices are just not that helpful and and we shouldn't be having to jump through hoops to get electronic copies of records in this day and age but we are so there you go um all right so let me let me look and see who we have here um i've written some people down jay crutman jim cameron joel blanchett John Appler, um, so who other than Jim Cameron, who do we have on the telephone today? Dennis Correa. Hello, Dennis. Howdy. Uh, Jim Harrington, Rick. And Jim Harrington. Okay. How are you, Jim Harrington? Oh, I'm doing fine, Rick. I'm I'm okay. You know, I'm just carrying on, and uh, yeah, things. I'm getting used to this. I'm doing fine. Okay. Okay. So let me tell you who I see on the call right now. Um, I see Jake Hannum, Jim Cameron, Jay Kruckman, Tebow Lincecum, Peter Kafka. Joel Blanchett, John Appler, Dennis Correa, Jim Harrington, and somebody who just arrived. Who just arrived? Rick, that was me, John Appler, dialing in. Oh, okay. All right. And Bill Burhans has just come in. Excellent. Professor Bill. Um, and somebody else just came in on the telephone? Yes, Rick, Jan and Sherry Streslick. Oh, hello. I just... Hello. Somebody just called me from Madison. Oh, you're kidding. No, somebody here in living in Tucson, having nothing to do, having nothing oh. to do with cancer at all, but referred to me by a good, very close friend of mine who's their doctor. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. So is that where, you, that's where you're living now? Yeah. Well, I'm living in a Tucson? place in Tubac, which is about 40 miles south of Tucson. Okay. Yeah, we have neighbors who moved there. So Gallagher is their name. In Tubac? <laughs> no, no, no. Tucson. Oh, in Tucson. Well, Tucson yeah. Has, Tucson now has... I don't know how many million people. When I yeah. was there originally, there was 625,000, but now the population's a lot bigger. Yeah. Um, okay. So welcome, John and Sherry. Um, all right. So let me go down the list one more time, since a bunch of people just came in. Uh, Jake, Jim Cameron, Jay Kruckman, Tebow. Peter Kafka, Joel Blanchett, John Appler, Dennis Correa, Jim Harrington, Bill Burhans, and Sherry and John Streslick. Did I miss anybody? Okay. Now, we're going to go out of order a little bit because I don't want to lose Tebow. And last time, he left because those kids pulled him away. Now, Tebow, I, I don't see your... Ah, now I see your microphone. How are you? I'm... Uh, I've had a little setback. Okay. I've been waiting for this trial uh, for a while now. Yes. But finally, I got all the approvals, and they're uh, working on selecting a, a donor for me for this bone marrow transplant. But in the meantime... I was avoiding chemo and radium-223 to stay eligible for the trial yeah. for eight months. And uh, one of my tumors got really big in my vertebrae, 
and it uh, started compressing my spinal cord. So I've got epidural compression, so pretty severe. My, uh, you can barely see my spinal uh, canal in the uh, oh. MRI, this one spot. So uh, we're going to have to treat that tumor with radiation, but it's so close to the spinal canal that they don't want to irradiate my spinal canal. And they're not going to be able to do the tumor at full strength without hurting the spinal canal. So before the radiation, I have to have surgery. They're going to remove the back section of three of my vertebrae above and below that spot tumor. And uh, that will allow the spinal canal to float back. So they'll have a gap between it and the tumor. And then they'll be able to... Radi irradiate the tumor with cyber knife in two weeks. Okay, so afterwards, with radiation, after uh, four weeks of waiting, then I can start the clinical trial. But do you have a match? The, it only requires a, a partial match. So they have multiple potential donors, and uh, they're getting blood samples from uh, several donor potential donors, and doing a, a, a test with that blood and my blood to, to see which one is the best match. But I thought in the past they were looking for more than a partial match. Have they just changed that now, Tebo, or, or not? It's partial match. They never planned on using uh, full matches. Oh, okay. Um, and so let me just... Let me just understand. So, so this surgery that they're doing, they're going to have to remove some vertebrae, t take away some vertebrae, or back portion, not the front portion. It's called a thoracic laminectomy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And which MT, which is epidural compression from a metastatic tumor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And where are you going to do this? At, at Hopkins? Yeah. And at the time that I saw the surgeon, I, I didn't really have any symptoms that I could tr attribute to this particular problem other than a little bit of tingling under my right arm. But uh, since then, I've started getting headaches, which is not normal for me. So I'm thinking it might be related. So hopefully the surgery will help with that. Um, hmm. It might, might not be related. I'm not sure. Yeah. And so, um, well, I, you know, of course, our thoughts are, are with you. Um, is there no, there's no other way to do this without the surgery? The cyber knife is not accurate enough to do it without removing this back portion to a lot to it's pretty uh, pretty accurate but the tumor is just really pressing up hard against my spinal canal mm. it needs well, some I don't gap. I don't know if Eric I don't know if Eric is on with us yet today or not he may be on but he's been he's been wrestling um, Eric bookbind has been wrestling with similar issues very similar issues um but they didn't want to do they didn't want to do surgery but he's doing cyber knife or sbrt i don't know it might not actually be cyber knife but it's sbrt for those of you listening um cyber knife is just a brand name it's one machine that delivers stereotactic um body radiation which is sbrt so um it's that cyber knife is, is a uh, one type of SBRT. Well, I, I wouldn't even say one type. It's SBRT delivered by one type of machine. What I should say. Yeah. Um, any, um, any progress on sequencing? Uh, no. I, I mean, do that. I mean, the, it seems to me that if you're going to do this surgery, at least they'll be able, they'll have something to sequence. 
Uh, well, they're taking the tumors in the front part of the vertebrae and they're removing the back part of the vertebrae. So they're, I don't think there actually is a tumor in that area. But that's a good question I'll ask. Yeah, I mean, if you know, they've got you opened up and they can get, they get, they can get a needle into the tumor, they may be able to, um, to do a biopsy of the tumor. That's a good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up. Please. Please. So, um, is Denmead, is Denmead your quarterback at this point in time? Uh, no, I'm still using a ton for, okay. you know, he's the guy that keeps up with everything that I'm up to. Okay. No, that's, that's fine. I just had uh, notified and, uh, I, I, uh, still in contact with him and the BMT coordinator. Um, okay. Um, so that's a lot. That's a lot. And when, when is, when's the surgery scheduled for Tibo? Thursday. Sorry? Thursday, this week. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, and, and um, if I write to you, uh, how do I, uh, you'll you'll have your phone. I can I can write to you or what? What's yeah, I'll have my phone. Okay, okay. Um. All right. Um. Well, let me throw this open. This is this. There's quite a lot, and there may be some guys that have some some questions for you on on, on all of this. Um. Anybody want to talk to Tebow about this? This procedure that we're discussing here. Questions? Thoughts? It's like, this is Bill Burhams. I'd just like to say the best of luck to you, T. Bill. Thanks. I've been sleeping a lot recently, and uh, you know, it's hard to know whether it's related or not, but uh, we'll see how I feel after. At this point, you're not symptomatic for that tumor? Well, I do have local pain in that area that I've had, like, for the past six months. Yeah. My older scans show that there isn't any, well, at least they say there isn't any spinal canal corruption, you know. But, uh, but those are those CTs were only abdominal, so I'm not sure whether they went up high enough to get this uh, to cover this thoracic vertebrae. Yeah, it's possible that it's been there for a while and they just weren't doing a broad enough area with the CT scans. Okay. Pain uh, has been getting a little bit worse. But uh, that doesn't count as a neurological symptom either. The first neurological symptom is the tingling in my arm. And that's only when I hit, hold my head in a certain position. And that started about a month ago. Uh, have you, have they done any scans, whole body scans recently, Thibaut? Do, have you, do you know if there's um, any other uh, Metastases that are showing up or on a comparison basis? Oh, I've got uh, lots more metastases than I had six months ago. They now uh, count them as innumerable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, will they do anything to stabilize your spine? No, apparently the uh, back section of the thoracic vertebrae uh, isn't very important. So they're just going to take it out and leave it out. And they say, uh, you know, I'll be back to full strength in a week. And uh, a couple months later, I'll have full stability and won't have to do anything differently from normal. Terrific. I think this is... Uh not too uncommon surgery for people as they get older. Tonectomy yeah. is the most common type of uh, back surgery, and the risks are very low. 
uh, especially in the thoracic section, I think most people get lumbar laminectomies. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the only concern I would have, and I would ask them and be very clear about this, is that the, the vertebrae that they're removing are not compromised by the cancer. Um, that the you know if the if this if this um, tumor is um, part of these vertebrae, the only concern I would have is that these um, the, the vertebrae are already compromised, and if you take away the back portion, what is there to guarantee that that the vertebrae won't collapse? I mean, I realize that taking away the back portion allows the allows the um, spinal canal to float into a right. more empty space, and then they can radiate the tumors. But uh, you know, be very, very clear with w w in your own mind that that these vertebrae are not already compromised, and when they take them away, as Bill says, you know, are they doing anything to the bolster of the vertebrae because if they get in there and the bones are mushy then it's an issue and i've seen that happen i mean i don't want to scare you but i but i want you to to make sure that you you've covered that pieces a good idea i should ask that question as well yeah yeah, yeah right. you know i we saw this with jerry good rest his soul and 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 they took him in, and 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 when they went in to do the surgery, the bones were too mushy, and and there was some severe repercussion. And that's what happens when the when the tumors get into the bone, then those bones become the the, the integrity of the bone is not good. And so the concern that I would have is, you know, how are they going to stabilize your spine? It's all well and good having the front of the spine of the vertebrae solid, which they say they can do and they could do in most people, but if the front of the vertebrae is compromised, then you don't, they, it, there's not enough strength there. They're taking away where the strength is. All right. And, and the question I would want to be asking the, I, I, it's probably an oncological surgeon that's going to do this. Um, yeah. And the question I'd want to be asking that surgeon ahead of time is, Doc, you know, do we have enough integrity left in the bones in the front to support the spine? And if oh, yeah. there's any question, then, you know, you've got to step back and decide what you want to do. Because you don't want to well, be, you don't want to finish up in, in a, in a uh, Possibility of needing a fusion and didn't think we needed that. Mm. Well, you I know, guess they, I could ask more about that. You know, they can put a plate in as well. Mm -hmm. I know people that have had that have had back surgery, not with can for cancer. But they put a plate in to stabilize the spine. So, you know, th these are the sorts of issues. So, if they need to support the back of that spine in some way, shape, or form, where the bones are healthy, then that should be discussed with you ahead of time because you don't want them to go in and then they've got to, they're finding stuff they weren't expecting because the cancer's not where they thought it was and then they've got to make decisions and you're not party to those decisions because you're, you're, you're deep in anesthetic. I uh, just uh, a week ago, so they, uh, they have a recent picture that they're going by. Right, 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 right. Okay, um, so um, I wanted to get you before I know you. I know you. You pop off because the kids call you, and we lost you last week. And I was sorry that we did that. So I wanted to be sure that we got to you quickly this time. Um, any questions you got for us on anything? Uh, no. Okay. Okay, and anybody else anybody else have anything that they'd like to raise with Tebo about this procedure or um, his treatment or the trial or anything else? Hi, this is Jake. I just want to wish him best of luck 
I'll, I'll say a prayer for you, Tebow. I should be in the hospital for another two or three days. They say that, uh, you know, I'll have plenty of back stability. I can walk pretty much immediately, but I'll be in too much pain to leave the hospital immediately. Mm -hmm. It's hard to control pain after operating on the spine directly. Right, 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 right. So um, I wish I was closer. We'd come visit, but uh, but we're not. Um, all right, Tibo. So talk to them about sequencing something somewhere. If you yeah. have these metastases, something should be should be biopsyable, and they can do it whilst you're under. So let them get a bloody biopsy whilst. It shouldn't be a total loss, as they say. And, you know, them. Thanks. And, you know, and check out this stability and this integrity issue, too, because that's, that's, really, um, that's really important. Okay. Um, so let me, let me run down the list and see who would like some, some time today. We don't, have any, we don't have any new folks on. Um, Okay. Um, so, Jake, anything for you? Um, no, Rick. I'm, I I see my doctor on Thursday. I'll get another. I get my Lupron shot and another blood test. So, okay. <clears throat> right now, not, nothing to talk about. Okay. Are you gonna? Are you gonna? Are you gonna tell her that you've got? Uh, you're on a thousand. Uh, milligrams of uh, metformin or are you going to keep that to yourself <laughs> no, i'll tell her <laughs> okay i'll tell her just wondering just just asking jay um jim cameron you 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 um you want would you uh, if whilst you're with us would you like to give everybody an update or yeah i can i can give everybody a, a brief update yeah okay uh jay Krockman. Anything for you today? Uh, just a uh, quick update. I met with uh, Dr. Morgan's last week. Okay, um, excellent. Yeah, we'd like to hear about that. Um, Peter, anything for you? I have a small question. Okay. You can make it a large one, too, if you like. The price, is, the price is the same. Joel Blanchett, anything for you? Joe Blanchett? Uh, no, nothing for me tonight. Okay. Okay. John Appler, have you started your treatment? Yeah, I have, Rick. I'm in my second week, actually, and uh, no bad side effects yet. I had a high AST score, but they retested, and that seemed to drop down almost into the normal range, so I seem to be pretty lucky so far. Okay, well, we'll come back to you, and you can just tell us what your experience is in going through the treatment. Um, sure. Dennis, anything for you? Dennis, anything for you? Okay, I, I didn't hear you. You uh, called my whole name. You got cut off. Uh, <clears throat> no, I don't have anything. Okay. Uh, Jim Harrington, anything for you? Uh, no, not tonight, Rick. Uh, I've got some scans coming up, so I'll just wait. Okay. Um, Professor Bill, anything for you tonight? Professor Bill? I think Bill must have stepped away. We'll come back to Bill. Um, Terry, any, do you have anything you'd like to discuss? Did you say Sherry? I did say Sherry. Oh, yeah. Um, we're just listening tonight, Rick. Thanks. Okay. Pleasure. Um, Larry Fish, anything for you tonight? Yeah. Hi, Ken. Hi, guys. Um, nothing special. I'm watching. I'm thinking about, like, what an Excel spreadsheet would look like. You know, I'm in that limbo stage where I stopped the Casadex, still getting Lupron. Okay. Watch the PSA drop. Now I see its level. 
Now I'm going to wait as it starts to rise and then see if I, any available trials are appropriate for me or when they can start to do a blood biopsy or I mean, a blood uh, sequencing or a tumor gets large enough for them to get a hold of. So I'm like in that limbo space right now. So do you want to, do you want to um, bounce that off of the group and see what they're thinking? I could, but I, I think I know where I'm at. Where I'll be happy to bounce it. Okay. Um, Bill Franklin, anything for you? He dropped off, Rick. Oh, he dropped off. And somebody just did join us. Who joined us on the phone? Somebody joined us on the phone just about five minutes ago. Okay. Um, Bill Burhans, are you back with us? Okay. Did I check in with everybody or have I missed anyone? Well, Paul Curry is here, but I have had nothing today. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. I didn't see you. I've added you. Okay. Anyone else that I missed? Okay, well, we'll check in again in a minute. So let's let's kick off with Mr. Cameron because he's he's Probably needs to go to bed early tonight. This is not a good day. Go ahead, yeah. Jim. Fill us in. Well, basically now we're, uh, I started the second second round of uh, chemo uh, last Friday. I was doing okay until yesterday and, and today. Kicked my butt real good. And uh, like if you heard earlier, we are waiting – for my foundation one reports to come back. One report has returned, but it's that's the one of my uh, liver, and that's, believe it or not, not the most important. The one is, this, we're waiting for the uh, spindle cell uh, on my, that grew on my prostate. And that's what we're, that's basically what we're waiting for, to see, see, what the, see what comes up with that, because that's supposed to be very aggressive and very rare. Um, and we should tell people that uh, I haven't seen it, but evidently the Foundation Medicine report on um, the liver shows that, um, that Jim might be receptive to Everolimus, which is a, a drug that some of you may have used before. I know that other people on the call have used it in the past. Um, it is a drug that's used for morphed disease, sometimes for neuroendocrine disease. Um, but I think that until a complete picture is obtained, and we have electronic copies of both of these reports that, um, you know, no, no, no change in Jim's treatment is going to happen. So our challenge right now is to try and get copies of both reports and um, electronic copies of both reports and get them circulated to the right, right doctors. Is that true? Yeah. It doesn't look like the second report is ready yet, though, so. Right, right, right. Did they go in at the same time? I can't remember. It, it went in, they went in exactly, they went both in, went in on the 22nd of, uh, of, of September. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I'll, um, we'll, ch we'll chase up Foundation Medicine tomorrow. And the one, the, one the, 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 the long one, that just came back. They told me it came back Thursday afternoon. Okay. 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 Um, all right. Now, one issue I know that Jim had because we spoke during the week was some some during it was actually during the the chemo was some bloody diarrhea. Um, has anybody else had to deal with that issue on the telephone? Um, Rick, it's Jim Harrington. Jim, what, what chemo are you getting? What drug are they giving you? Uh, is it just a taxol? 
Yes. I, went, I gotta get out to, I gotta get out the sheets. It's Okay, well I just was wondering because I mean I've been on it now for about a couple months and uh yeah, I got a little diarrhea. I've never had blood though, uh, in my stools. Um but I mean I yeah, I do get a little diarrhea now and then sometimes <clears throat> uh, right after the infusion, which they put in the dosotaxel over an hour, um, sometimes, but on balance, not too bad. I think that, you know, you hit a nadir, Jim, and you're maybe in your nadir now, where you start to feel crappy, as my doctor put it, and um, and you come out of it the other side. If you're in a three-week cycle, you should feel pretty good in the last half of the cycle anyway. So you have something to look forward to. Um, that's just the way chemo goes. Um well, this is I mean, the, this is my second my second cycle. Okay. The first well, cycle went just about like you said. The, the first it was good the first couple of days, and then four boom, days were a little rugged, and then then it then it kind of stabilized the last two weeks. Yeah, that's that's the way it goes. That's chemo, and um, yeah. I'm on I'm on two different chemos. I gotta oh, find, I get them out of my dose attack. So dose attack and carboplatin. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm getting them both. I'm getting them both uh, at the same day. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Well, you know, like all of us who've been on chemo, and we hope to come out the other end with success. You know, I mean, right now I've got this metallic taste in my mouth, and I sure wish that I didn't have that. And as one of the guys on the call said, he eats everything with a plastic spoon. I haven't done that, but it sure does affect your taste and foods and so forth. And I think as time goes on, it Certainly doesn't get any better. Well, good luck, Jim. That's what they've been warning me. That uh, so far I, I haven't had any problems with food to speak of. How about your appetite? Have you you still have an appetite? When did you start having trouble with food, Jim? About what oh, I, I I mean, Jim, I I mean, it, I I've, I've really kind of lost my appetite. Uh, it doesn't bother me much. Um, I, I choose foods carefully. Not spicy foods. I never was a spicy food kind of guy. I, I think it just gets a little bit worse. And uh, but the taste in my mouth, this. But I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you now, and I can feel it in my mouth. Uh, just so I. I mean, I was eating a hamburger the other day, and I just threw the damn thing away because it just wasn't what I wanted. I mean, you just have to pick foods that. I don't know what to say. <laughs> you like? I, I and, find foods that are that are moist. Yeah, because you, what you're experiencing, Jim, I think, and Rick would say too, is a bit of dry mouth. So you really got to use, drink water. Um, you might try biotin products, which are good for, there's no alcohol in them and they're good for dry mouth. There are things you can do, but drink I, water. I have, I have something for that now. I was, I was having a lot of dry mouth. Oh, that's they, right. Yeah, I remember that from before. Yeah. That, I mean, they, I just think drink water, you know, or apple juice. That and Gatorade. I drink a lot of Gatorade. Yeah, Gatorade, right, to replace your fluids, right. I, I don't, I'm not a particular fan of Gatorade, but, yeah, that's a good suggestion. But I find I like mo- moist, like like in the morning to have toast or something like that. Is t- that you know, it's like eating cardboard. Yeah, I know the feeling. Well, I had a piece of toast this weekend. It, I, mean, I know it was cardboard. And uh, I think that. You know, you. I mean, like my, my, I have I have three dietitians. I mean, I got more doctors and Carter has liver pills. But in any case, you know, um, in eat eggs, eat hard boiled eggs, eat something with protein. I drink Ensure in the mornings, and it's easy. Uh, I'm sure it's the best thing to do, but it, it's pretty good drinking, especially in live. It's got a lot of protein and calories, so I do that. But. I have a I have a drink that I get up at Costco with a, a chocolate drink. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. It's, it's so many protein drinks. Yeah, I think like that 30, stay away from uh, protein in, a, in one little can. Yeah, stay away from citrus. They say I mean, orange juice, tomato juice is another one. Um, I don't know if that if that's causing your problem. I my problem with those attacks was I have my stomach gets a little sore, but otherwise I don't vomit. I um, yeah, constipation, diarrhea. Well, that's the way it goes, you know. Good yeah, luck, Jim. I, go back, I, I swing. I, I discussed it with him this morning when I was over to center. I go back and forth between constipated and diarrhea. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. You know, they list them both, and I thought that was funny. How can you be constipated and, and have diarrhea? It's, no, it can happen. You start with constipation, then it turns to diarrhea. Yeah, it's 
you stop yeah, the diarrhea and happen. now you're constipated. Then you then yeah, you, I know, I know. I take one thing I take, Jim, and it might help you is Senecad S. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of um, I and you can take Miralax. Of course, that's just going to cause a bowel movement. But Senecad S, um, you can buy in any drugstore. It isn't real cheap. Um, really, I take a couple of night if I start to be constipated, and it, it works very well. So look up Senecad S. Uh, it comes from our chemo nurse and I, I, how to handle diarrhea and so forth so or constipation. They mentioned that to me. You know what I've been, you know what I've been drinking that uh, when, I, when I get constipated is plain old prune juice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that works. Yeah. It, it takes it usually usually doesn't work till the next day, but it but, but, but it works well. Yeah. Well, like I said, Senecad S is very much in that category. It's just not prune juice. But I, I agree. I, what can you say against prune prune juice? It's been around forever, right? So. Yeah. So let me ask <laughs> let me ask uh, Dennis Korea and Larry Fish. Because I know you, you guys have both been through chemo. Um, I don't know who else on the call has, if anyone. But do you have any? Do you have two cents you'd like to put in on this topic? Yeah, yeah. I would say, you know, from a serious standpoint, watch out for fever. If you start to have a run of temperature, and they told me it's 100.4 or higher, you get to the emergency room. And it could be the start of a, a neutrophil fever, which I came down with a uh, pretty serious uh, situation with uh, multiple pulmonary embolisms in both lungs and pneumonia and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, five days in the hospital and they got me under control, then reduced my uh, my dose so I could get through the rest of the uh, the course of the chemo. And I also added uh, new Lasta too. But they have me on new. They have me on new Lasta. Yeah, that'll probably prevent it from happening. They, I, yeah. Matter of fact, I had. You know, you know, you've had the new last on there. Did you find them real sticky on your arm to get off when it was done? I that wasn't available when I got mine a little over a year ago. I just had to go back down and get a shot. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jim, um, I, I have no last of the uh, on pro, the one they, they put it on my stomach. Yeah, it really sticks because once that needle goes into you, yeah, it's really good to get a protective shower in that, but it works. And you yeah, back. It's, it's almost like if you can almost time it 27 hours later. Oh, yeah, yeah. It starts, it beeps at you and it blinks green. A nice little $5,000 device, isn't it, Jim? Is that what it cost? Uh, that's what they listed at. Um, but Every time I have I have done the last a little pump and yeah it blinks and you know you're blinking green and but I don't I've heard they pay I don't know what insurance pays three thousand I don't know Rick maybe you know but what are you gonna do about it it's it's, uh, it's, it's what they it's tell me to anything going back to the back to the center yeah right, right. twenty seven hours you can do it at home and then you just you know what I suggest to you is get someone to help you peel it off. Get your wife or somebody, and then they can grab the ends. But yeah, it sticks really well because. Well, the first one I had done worked worked that way. Friday I got one. I came home, and the thing popped off my arm. Oh well, mine goes on the stomach. Put it on the stomach. Uh, you know, your arm is small. The stomach is. You might ask them about it, but they always put mine on the stomach. Oh, they, well, they asked me whether I want it on my stomach or my arm. You know, oh, so I, I see. Okay, well. Yeah. Okay. Well. How do you find it sleeping at night with it on your stomach? Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. I just look at the little blinking light. If I wear a, a light colored shirt, then I'm, I'm flashing. <laughs> no, no problem. I can sleep on it, and uh, I protect it in the shower the next morning. But uh, they think they got a batch down here because I was the fourth or fifth person that went back to the center last week. When they got home, the thing popped off their arm. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't one, have an experience with that. The first, like you say, the first one, I had to help my, my wife had to help me get the thing off. I thought, you know, oh, yeah, it, it like, really sticks. Yeah, once it goes on you and before the needle goes in, yeah, yeah, it, it really sticks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. Well, 
Um, anybody else that hasn't spoken want to say anything about um, these chemo side effects? Or I'm just going to change something. Oh, so this I can get my... We'll we'll move along. Did you want to put that on your camera? Okay. I think Dennis just uh, just muted, so that's good. Um, okay. So, Jim, I will um, try and get something out to you or to David Marshak or to both of you tomorrow, and we'll see if we can chase down these results. And get if them. I get the number, I'll call, I'll, I'll, call them in the, uh, I'll call them in the morning. Okay. Well, I'll take care of it when we get done with it, when we get done. Um, yeah. Jay Kruckman. How was your experience with Dr. Morgan's? Overall, it was uh, very good. Um, the only downside, she's not in my network, so it's a little pricey. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, but uh, no, I met with her up in, up in Chicago at Northwestern, and um, her and her staff were excellent trying to get everything put together for my, for my meeting up there. Um, realized that probably couldn't make it work uh, for my financial side, not being in the network. But uh, we'll revisit that as we go forward with uh, different possible insurance. But um, she was she was very good listening, very good at um, communicating her thoughts and and everything else. Um, we talked about the process I have been through. Um, I had another PSA just before, you know, a couple, week or two before I left to go up there, and um, it was it's rising still. But they also gave me a prescription for Casadex, which I did not start yet. I wanted to talk to her first, and uh, her point was basically there's no reason to start just Casadex. If you're gonna do something, you got to do something more than that. Um, so she said. Uh, Currently, the decisions we've been making have been uh, probably the ones she would uh, or she concurs with um, into doing an intermittent process for me right now. Um, she did recommend a oncologist um, in my area down here. He's actually in Jackson, Tennessee, a Dr. Brian Walker. Um, she's very familiar and has worked with him. Um, I'm assuming between Vanderbilt and Jackson, Tennessee, they're only probably hour hour and a half apart mm -hmm. um, unfortunately talking with them he's not in my network either oh, yeah. um, so we're tra trying to work through that issue and, and see what's up but um basically she concurred with what what i've been going through um she did recommend that uh, before the end of the year i would get a uh, ct uh abdomen and pelvis and bone scan done just to see um, if there's anything to be seen at this point in time. But I was very impressed with her. Um, I'd love to deal with her on a, on a regular basis. Um, I just don't think it's going to work. But no, I, I th thought she was great. Okay. So a couple of things that, that occurred to me. Um, one is, um, given that it's coming to, um, to a new year, is it possible for you to to switch your your medical insurance, Jay, or not? Um, I believe it is. I actually just started that today. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have some of the information I needed to get in and find find the find that out. But uh, I actually don't recall last year when I signed up what what it was, um, how many choices I had. But I'm investigating that currently, and hopefully, I have an answer on that tomorrow. Um, you, I'm, I'm just trying to re recall, I'm just looking at my notes, um, do you have, I mean, I know your PSA is creeping up, the last, the last one I had was 0.37, was that, was that the last one you had? Yes. Right. Yes. So, I know that your PSA is creeping up, um, but you have no evidence of um, of any metastasis or in, in either your lymph nodes or your bones anywhere, do you? No, um, I have not had a scan now for almost three years, but uh, those were all clean, clean. So 
there's no reason to believe I do have any metastasis. Well, he, here's a thought for you, okay? I mean, and I, and I hope you do not. But if something were to show up on the scan, then you would be automatically eligible for SSDI. And mm -hmm. with SSDI, you don't necessarily have to take the payments, but you can establish a date of disability, which in your case might be backdated because you've been dealing with this disease for a long period of time. It was backdated in my, in my case, for example. And if it's backdated more than a couple of years, you become immediately eligible for Medicare. And if you become immediately eligible for Medicare, you've solved your insurance issues because there are supplemental plans that are not that expensive, probably a couple of hundred dollars a month and somewhere between $150 and $200 a month that will allow you to see doctors anywhere in the country with United Healthcare. And I think the others have it too, but I tend to think the United Healthcare is the best. They're not easy to deal with. I'm having a heck of a time trying to find a PCP. I'm working with them right now, but I do know that once you're into the system, they're pretty good about approving costs. I think they're better than than I think they're better than the other options that are out there, Humana and 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 Blue Cross, etc. So I would I would try and get those scans done um, sooner rather than later because God forbid they're not good. It, it, you know, on the one hand, it's not a good situation. On the other hand, it could solve your solve your problem. Right. No, and I, I will get them done by the end of the year, um, somehow in here. I have another uh, PSA check in three weeks. So right. I, they had already set me up with an appointment with this Dr. Brian Walker for October 30th. I told him I'd probably like to get another blood check before then or, or meet with him after I get my next blood check and then set up the scans and everything else. But um, they're supposed to get back with me this uh, in the next day or two in regards to uh, the financial responsibilities not being in enough in their network. So, um, you know, the the other thing I just wanted to comment on because it literally came up today this morning uh, came to my attention. I do understand what what Dr. Morgan's is saying about well, it's probably not worthwhile starting the case of it but there's a gentleman in um niagara falls that i've been working with now probably three years or so he's an older guy he's, he's over 80 and um his psa is and he has metastasis but not very much and it's and his metastasis is very very stable and he has done chemotherapy which probably helped to stabilize the disease. But his PSA is creeping up, similar, kind of similar to yours. He started on Casodex and it brought his PSA down from 2.0 something to 0.79 in a matter of four weeks. Now, that's, it's unusual. You don't always see that. But there can be reason to start case addicts. And, you know, it's just something that I just want to let you know because because I just was dealing with it today. I would tend to think that the advice you're getting from Dr. Morgan's is good, but I just want you to know that sometimes case addicts can work. And when she did not, her comment was basically you're taking a, uh, ADT light, um, and it's just it, you know, is it is it worth it at this point in time because my numbers are still so low and I was yeah. so responsive to yeah. um, Lupron the first time, so yeah. she didn't see the reason. But I understand what you're saying. I appreciate appreciate the comments. Okay. Um, David, you know, go surgery, ahead. Jen. Was your treatment originally? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Was your initial treatment surgery prostatectomy? Yes, yes, I had prostatectomy. Um, about eight months later, I had radiation. And then about a year after that, I went on uh, hormone treatment. And I've been off hormone treatment for about 15 months now was my last injection. What's your Gleason score? It was a, a 743. So, yeah, very similar to my situation, except I'm a Gleason 9, but I'm working with the same thing. So she's, Dr. Morgan is happy with you continuing on your holiday, on your, um, on your ADT holiday? Yes. Okay. Yes. And she would like to scans before the end of the year, um, but to continue on that and decide at some point, whatever number that may be, to, uh, to go back on. I told her I had real bad side effects from the Lupron. Firmagon, I start off Firmagon. That wasn't too bad, I don't think. Uh, the Lupron just messed me up mentally more than anything. And uh, But she said there's several others out there to probably take care of it just as well. Yeah, I mean, and I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the Firmagon. I think that it's a cumulative effect that, you know, you, you could have had Lupron and it wouldn't have affected you the first month or the first three months. But the second time you got Understood. it, you're starting to build up because they basically are doing the same thing. So, yes. you know, I, don't, I, I wouldn't nail the, the Firmagon for that. It's really more of a, the, 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 um, the cumulative. Um, but, um, okay, I mean, uh, look, you, you're now in good hands. It's just a question of how we can keep you in good hands with, in terms of insurance. Right. So we'll just keep going. Okay. Um, Peter, did you want did you want to say anything else to to Jay? Well, my situation, my question follows up with him because it's a very similar situation. I just my PSA doubled this month. Um, it's it's still low. It's only uh, uh, went from as 0 0.08 to a 0 0.15. Um, and I, I put my question into Dr. Turner uh, a couple of hours ago. I don't have a reply yet. I guess my, my question is, uh, I know Zytiga has been shown to be successful for, for early treatment with metastatic disease, but what about non-metastatic disease? And what about Guys, like in Jay's situation or my situation, where nothing yet has shown up on a scan, does it make sense to go to Zytiga or does it make more sense to go back on Lupron um, when it's the right time? Um, I don't know if there's any studies on that, like there is for, for metastatic disease. Um, I think the answer is there aren't, but th th there aren't any that have reported, but there are studies that are being done um, and, and we don't also we don't really have full details on a couple of studies like the PROSPER study um, for the enzalutamide is one that we don't have full information and then the uh, apalutamide the ARN uh, 509 I think it is um, we don't have Full information. All we know is that they seem to be effective, but we don't know how. And as as Mike Scott indicated this past week, um, we, you know we can expect probably in uh, February at San Francisco at the GU conference there um, that some of these studies will get reported out. Um, you know, I do strongly strongly recommend that you listen to the discussions that i linked in the um in the call notice right that the discussion between um sweeney at 
Dana Farber, Morgan's at Northwestern, and Ryan at UCSF, because they do talk about whether they should be introducing uh, second line antiandrogens when you're still um, without, when there's still no evidence of metastasis, but there is some evidence of, of, of resistance. And so you can hear it from the horse's mouth. I mean, my own feeling is that, you know, if it works for early metastasis, it probably works before early metastasis as well, but we don't have the results yet. And as they say, one of the very big questions is, can you get your insurance to pay for it? And there's a um, there's an overriding uh, opinion, not just with them, but we're also with the surgeons. They they there's another discussion, a different tape that Scott recommended, which I frankly do not recommend, which is a discussion between Morgan's Ryan and two urologists who treat advanced disease, and you know, something that comes out of that and the first discussion is if you don't think your doctors, if you don't think your insurance is going to pay for a second line antiandrogen, then do the chemotherapy because they'll pay for that. And, um, and that's, you know, sort of um, a, a path of lesser resistance. At the same time, the doctors all agree that if there's a choice between the pills and the, and the chemotherapy, that they prefer to go to the pills because the patients prefer that. So, right. you know, there's no, there's no clear, um, there's no, there's no clear path. Has, have any of you listened to that discussion yet? Yes, yes I, I have. Right. Yeah. yeah, I have oh. too. Okay. Am I, am I interpreting it? the way you do, because my memory isn't always the best, and I, I've got a lot of stuff that I try to absorb. Am I interpreting it correct, or did any of you um, come up with a different interpretation? No, I believe, it, I believe that they, they favored the pills first. Right. Anyone else? Oh. Rick, my, my question is that when I when I went off the Lupron and the Casadex, I was I was not uh, castrate resistant, you know. So I I am not legally castrate resistant. Right. So the, do I you know do I have a choice of going on early uh, second line or do I have to first fail Lupron? Well, again, you know, the, the, there are studies being done right now of uh, introducing men. With um, uh, to the second line antiandrogens when they're not castrate resistant. I mean, yeah. there, there are okay. studies being done. I can't give you the names of them. I'd have to go in. I'd have to go research. I, there, there I can are. Look them up and Sorry. I can look them up and research it. I'll look at that. But there are studies being done, but they haven't reported out. That's the problem. And so, you know, that means that it's going to be very hard to get those drugs approved by your insurance company. And I think that that sort of gets to be the bottom line. You've got to figure out how you're going to pay for this because those drugs are running at, you know, out of pocket. They're nine, ten grand a month. And even even if they are covered, it's it still can be as much as twenty eight hundred dollars a month. Right. Hey, hey, this is Larry Fish. Uh, you know that when you're talking, I've been looking at some of these studies. I don't have any of them offhand, but I've been looking at the the different variations of the the ones that we're looking at adding gabaradaron before uh, there was a metastasis v visible, um, before. Uh, you know, with Lupron or without Lupron, and 
the thing, the, the idea was that the one advantage of trying, they were still recruiting all those studies that started. I forgot which ones. I've done so many. But the thing about thinking about a study is that if you're in the study, you're not paying for the drug. That they're going to maybe two, one or two years before these studies start to come out with any results that any FDA would think about approving. But, uh, but why not, if you're going to think about going on uh, on therapy again and taking Lupron again, why not try to get, I mean, rather than going on docetaxel again, if you can, you know, why not try to get into one of these studies and to get Abiraterone, Zytiga, and Zalutamide? What, I mean, if they're going to be paid for and the side effects are not unbearable compared to another option, just because I think that's like where life expectancy is going to be, have the best chance of being extended right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody has thoughts like that, but that's what I've sort of been thinking about. Yeah, I mean, Larry makes a great point. I mean, if, if there are studies there for men who are um, not castrate resistant, who are still responding to um, first line antiandrogens, um, and they have the opportunity to access drugs like enzalutamide or abiraterone. Um, what's the downside? Well, one downside, you could argue, is that, well, you're going to go back on hormone therapy. And so for somebody like Peter, who's, do, who's on a holiday and enjoying that holiday because he's feeling so good, uh, the question is, well, maybe wh why don't I just go back on... ADT and I'll respond for a while and then I'll go on another holiday and maybe the next round the results will be out. Um, you know, I think that uh, it, it's sort of in a sense, Peter, gets back to the discussion I think we had last week that when you are uh, going to do a, um, a uh, hormone therapy vacation, you have to really have a plan in mind as to how long you're going to stay off the drug and you know what the threshold is going to be before you come on i mean you could be it could be another uh, nine months or a year god willing or longer before you get up to one but then you know that the 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 the, the offset to that is well would I nail the disease even harder if I went back on now with abiraterone or enzalutamide, Zytiga or Xandi? We don't have an answer. Right. No, those questions are going around in my head, believe me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you're not the only one. I know, I know. How many of you saw the, the, the real interesting... Um, Com the study that, 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 that Mike Scott um, referenced today where there's somebody in Europe looking at whether you need to stay on Lupron when you go on Zytiga. I mean, the theory has always been, and I've heard, I've heard Chuck Ryan say this. I mean, I've been in appointments where he's, at, where he's said it. Yeah, you know, keep that testosterone level. Uh, very, very low, because even though you're castrate resistant, the testosterone only fuels the fire. So we want you on ADT, even though you're on abiraterone, on, on Zytiga. Well, guys, I mean, if you could let your testosterone come back and feel good, and you could be taking the Zytiga, which is not going to reduce your testosterone, that would be a heck of a solution. You know, I think everybody who's who's on LHRH drugs would drop them in a heartbeat if they thought they could take a different drug that didn't restrain their testosterone. But we don't know. Again, I mean, you know, this is a study that, is, as, as Scott says, we're waiting to see. And it's interesting. It's not going to take long to get results from that study. I mean, they're, they're looking at, um, what the difference is after 12 months on radiographic progression. So basically, they're going to look at men. All these men, I believe, have um, 
meta metastasized disease who are in the study, and they're going to look after a year and see if the people who had uh, Zytiga alone did any worse than the people that had Zytiga plus uh, Lupron or Zolidex or Firmagon or whatever it was they were on. But we, we've got to wait. Now, you know, the other thing, Larry, that I, I just want to say is that sometimes we don't have to wait huge lengths of time for the results, because if they if they see if the scientists see that the drug is working, then they may cut the trial short and get approved early for um, by the FDA. And that and that that's happened. That happened with I can't remember. It was I think it was the enzalutamide. I think abiraterone took a long time, but enzalutamide took a short period of time. And I think it also happened with radium-223. And there's a number of prostate cancer drugs over the last five years that have gotten approved much, much more quickly than having to wait for like 10 year results. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't necessarily assume that just because it's in trial, it can take years and years for the results to come out. It could be, but it isn't. It isn't always the case. Rick, this is yeah. this is Jake. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the AR509 uh, apalutamide. Um, I'm reading the press release. You know, it was submitted to the FDA specifically for non-metastatic castrate resistant. There you go. Right. Cancer. Right. And it is, but it was done. This this tests were done with ADT and apalutamide versus ADT alone. Plus placebo, so right. Um, that may answer some of the questions. It doesn't it doesn't get you off the ADT, but at least it it does. It's specifically for non-metastatic. Correct. Thanks for reminding me about that. That that's what that was one of the things that was going through my mind, but I couldn't remember it clearly. Like I say, my mind gets a bit cluttered sometimes, and it's going through one of those periods right now. Um, but yes, thank you very much, Jake. Yeah, there you go. So the so, so Peter, you know the the um, the ARN five hundred nine apalutamide. There's a drug that they're looking for men who are not castrate resistant. And I don't know if they're still running trials with it or where they are. I mean, but they they seem to think they're getting results, and they've they've thrown it in. It's um, I think it's a it, Johnson, it, 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 Johnson drug. Or, they say Johnson, Janssen. Johnson, but why they wouldn't say Jan Johnson. Janssen, Janssen Biotech. Okay, so it is Janssen. I, I I thought it should be Janssen, but a report that I read just referred to it as Johnson and Johnson because all of the Janssen drugs are um, all of the Johnson Johnson oncology drugs are with Janssen. I I put the link uh, to the to the uh, to the uh, submission notification in the box if anybody's interested. And it was it was a phase three trial called the Spartan. That's it, Spartan. Spartan trial. Right, 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 right. right. They don't give any results. They they don't show you know uh, any any of the any of the clinical trial results. But apparently it was somewhat successful. So right. Well, that's what I was saying. This is the one where where Scott was saying that the apalutamide and the and the Prosper trial for enzalutamide. We don't exactly know what the results are. Um, but we'll find out pretty soon, and they they both seem to be pretty successful. Who else would like to chip in on this conversation? No one. Rick? Yes. Yeah, Rick. Is there a good site we should all register? on to make sure that if these kinds of trials come up for which we have an appropriate condition that we can get in them and to Larry's point get these drugs you know free uh, and, and help uh, research also I think I think you I think you're on it it's us I mean there, there is no way you have to do your own research there's no there's no site that's going to say well if I have this that or the other then I should be in a certain trial. I mean, what you have to do is you have to be watching, you have to be listening to what Scott's telling you. I mean, I've, I've mentioned it many times. All of you should be on new prostate cancer uh, info link. 
um, because right. he, he reports those out. I've referenced it many, many times, and it's linked on the website. So, you know, he reports a lot of the stuff out, but not everything. Uh, we report some of the stuff out that we hear here. We, we hear here, hear here. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, but th there is, there really isn't. Uh, you know, one one of the things you can do is you can go to the clinicaltrials.gov and you can and you can look yourself as we showed you in the how to do that in the um, in the, how to get the most out of the internet. And then there's uh, Emerging Meds, which is another private site. Um, and but it, it's it's hard work. There's no silver bullet solution to to finding the trials that are most appropriate for you you know i mean i got it Whoop. i've 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 offered you know i i if, if you if people want me to research it and they're willing to make a significant donation for on an hourly basis to answer cancer i can research it for you but um, it, it's just hard work and time and going through a lot of trials, John. I, there, there, I don't know a shortcut. If anybody else does, I, I wish you would let us know. What was the second site you mentioned, Rick? The private site, uh, Med something? Emerging Meds. Emerging Meds, thank you. Yeah, so Emerging Meds, and that again, um, if you haven't watched the presentation that I did the PCRI watch it because I reference emerging meds and clinicaltrials.gov on that in that presentation, and um, and they are a privately held company. I actually know the lady that started it about nine or ten years ago, and um, they're the ones that are driving a lot of these sites like us too. <clears throat> and Foundation Medicine, who tell you that they will give you a um, an evaluation of what trials are available to you, and what they're doing is linking into Emerging Meds, and they're just giving you their the Emerging Meds report, and they're labeling it, they're branding it themselves, but it's not their report; it's an Emerging Meds report. Interesting. So that's that's emerging meds' most recent business model is they're obviously selling. I don't know what they're getting for that, but they're obviously selling their, um, their services to to, to nonprofits and private companies. So okay, so we'll move along. Let me just check in. Um, Bill Burhans, did you have anything you wanted to talk about tonight? I think we lost Dr. Bill. And Bill Franklin, you're back with us. I, when I checked in before, you weren't. Do you have anything you'd like to talk to us about? No, I'm listening in. I actually lost my internet connection a while ago, so. Oh, okay. I got it back. Okay. All right. I just wanted to check in with you. Um, and I just don't see any. I think everybody else we we we've checked in with. So we'll, we'll move along and um, let's go to Peter and then John Appler and then um, that's, I'm, I'm not sure, I can't, yeah, I think that was it. Did, Sherry, did you want to talk or I, I'm not sure? Or are you just listening in? No, just, just listening, Rick. Okay, I've had a tick by your name, but, the, but I just unticked it. And then possibly Larry right at the end. So, um, Peter, uh, you've started to tell us a little bit. Do you want to expand anything on that? Uh, no, but I did just uh, just get an email uh, reply from Dr. Turner, and he 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 said, so "Let's wait till I get up to a 0.5 and scan, and then we'll look at ADT or whatever at that point." Um, that's that's his recommendation. Um, okay, that's great. Yeah, and 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 it just it, I just uh, 
I, I know there's some con there's some conflict sometimes about uh, the aggressiveness of, a, of Dr. Turner and other ones, but I, I just want to put in a plug that it's amazing, you know, particularly living way out here in the middle of the Pacific like I am, to have a doctor that you can send an email question to, and a few hours later you get an answer, mm -hmm. and you don't get a don't get like call the nurse and uh, and tell them your credit card number or uh, make an appointment. I mean, he's, he's just there. He responds. Mm -hmm. it's, it's well, having a doctor that you know um, responds mm -hmm. it makes a difference in my life. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, I mean, I'd endorse that. And yeah. not only that, what I'd also say is he's willing to come up with a number. And, you know, right. you have docs that don't come up with a number, but, and we've talked about that. And, and I, I think that for those of you, again, I said it earlier in this call, but it's appropriate to say it, to restate it right now, <clears throat> that if you're on a drug holiday, if you're on an, if you're on a um, uh, hormone therapy holiday, push your doctors, to find out what's on their mind in terms of when you'll restart so that you have something direct. I mean, 0 0.5 is low, but that's Dr. Turner's style, as Peter said. But the fact is, at least Peter knows where he's going. Other doctors right. might not start you till you get to two, but at least have that number. I mean, I, I'm not making any judgments of whether what's the right number, but what I, I am saying is, you should push your doctor so you get that number. So, um, well, I think that's great. At least you know where you're going, Peter. You know where you you know where you're heading with this guy. Right. And then I, I know that brings up another question, which we don't need to get into this evening. But the the whole scan issue is is, is such a, a big emerging field too. You know, whether they go to the gallium 68 scans now, you know, which seems to be pretty effective, or, or you know, lower level scans, so there's, a, there's a lot of consideration of that. Well, again, I mean, I, I, I and um, you know, we have we can talk about we, we, we have enough time that we can talk about that at the 10 minutes if people want to talk about it 10 or 15 minutes, but. For those of you who did read the call notice, I, I actually referenced that this this week. Right, right. And um, the best scan that seems to be out there right now is this 18F DCF PYL scan, um, which is available in certain places around the country in trial, but it's kind of hard to to be eligible for it. Um, it's a scan that's being used both at very early stages of the disease and for men that have recurrent disease. But unless you have a identifiable metastasis that can be biopsied within about four weeks of starting the trial, um, you're not eligible for that scan. However, the general opinion is that it is a better scan than the gallium 68 scan a better scan than anything else that's out there so i don't know where i don't know where i read it rick but but the fda just approved a 7t mri yeah um it's very limited as you can imagine because the the machinery is extremely expensive um so there are going to be very few and far between, but apparently it has been approved for what it's worth. Yeah, I mean, the question is, and I, I just have no idea. I mean, it, would a 7T MRI make any difference to scanning for metastasized disease? Because that's not usually the equipment that's used. I don't know. They, I don't know. They, 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 the article I saw was had very limited information, but apparently the stronger, the better, the more accurate, the more, uh, you know, the more uh, yeah, but, precise. Right, but, but don't confuse the modes 
J. So, you know, there are CT machines, there are MRI machines, and I, I don't know, I mean, some of you may do, but I think that these gallium and PYL scans don't use MRI machines. Oh, is that a PET CT? I believe so, yes. Okay. And that's what I'm saying. So we have to be careful not to muddy the waters here. Right. And I honestly don't know whether a 7T MRI would be a better way to identify metastasis than using some of these PET CT scans with these fancy um, agents. Anybody? Uh, Rick? Yes. Um, I, I happen to have a fraternity brother who, whose, whose family has owned a business that installs these things in hospitals. And so he surprised me one time when he told me that the 7T uh, device is not necessarily better than the three for certain kinds of um, scans. I don't remember the specifics, but I, I just had assumed that 7T would be better all around. And, uh, and apparently that's not true. I don't know why. I'll try to look into it okay. in more detail. Uh, but I was quite surprised. And if anybody knows, uh, you know, he, he would know because, like I say, he's, his family's been in the business uh, for, uh, you know, for more than one, more than two generations. Okay. Yeah. Any, anybody else have anything they'd like to um, throw in on, on these, the scanning issue right now? Yeah, I, I, just, I, 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 was, I sent you a the other day that I picked up off of, I think, Oncology Daily or something like that, or, or Euro Today, about a guy who uh, knew something was going on metastatically, but he didn't know where. And he tried the 3T MRI and um, didn't show anything, but it, it was good for the prostate itself, but nothing showed up. And the, the 68 gallium picked up the metastasis in the lymph nodes, mm -hmm. which the, the MRI did not. So, um, you know, it's just a, I, I think there's scans that will look at different tissue or, or whatever more in a more finite way than, because uh, I had thought that the, that the uh, 3T MRI was optimal, but I don't think it is in all situations. No, I don't think it is either. Somebody else, was that you, John Appler, that wanted to say something? No, I'm just curious in the case of Peter's case. I mean, I was told that the uh, PET scan PSMA at uh, UCSF could detect millions of cells in a cluster versus uh, billions of cells, which is the traditional you know, FDA-approved kind of level up from that. So, you know, if you have rising PSA, don't you want to go back on ADT, Peter, no matter what, because of there's there's something growing that's at an undetectable level? And doesn't your doctor wait until 0.5? Doesn't that make that, you know, growing metastasis, you know, more of a threat to you? Well, it's a, yes, that's an interesting question. That's why I, uh, I wrote to him right away. Um, but I mean, there's, there's different doctors will have different ways to, to go with this. Um, and that's that's one way of looking at it. But it's um, his, his thought is 0.5 is actually a pretty low threshold. Most doctors would wait till, till a, a, a two or something, much higher threshold. Uh, you know, to go with a with good scan at 0.5, I think is, is probably a a reasonable approach. It doesn't. It doesn't. I don't think it lets things get out of hand. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So, so John, the, you know, the, there have been studies done on intermittent hormone therapy and how effective it is, and. Um, and what they found was that it goes back to 2012, and it was pretty. Um, it, it, it was a, it was a, sort of a watershed study um, that for men who were 
placed on hormone therapy from the outset that intermittent hormone therapy didn't seem to be any worse than staying on hormone therapy all the time. But for men who had recurrent disease or metastasized disease and came back or when it came back, they were placed on hormone therapy like HEDA, that it may not be as good to go on intermittent than it is to stay. So then you say, well, what if that's the research, that's what it shows, why does PETA consider intermittent hormone therapy? Because the, the results aren't that significant and the quality of life outweighs the disadvantage. So, you know, these yeah. are all things that you have to take into account when you decide whether you want to go off hormone therapy. That's a good point. Peter, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, in my situation, actually, I hormone therapy was my initial treatment. I mean, I started from the get-go, before surgery, before radiation. I was oh, in an unusual okay. situation. Okay. So, uh, fall into that category, actually. Okay. You know, I, I started right off the bat. Okay, yeah, I forgot about that. That's true. That's absolutely true. So I stand corrected. Peter just wants to chase his girlfriend around the dining room table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, does she have a say in this, Peter? She sure does. She sure does. She sure does. <laughs> He's very sharp. You're very lucky, Peter. I am. Happy, very glad. Yes. So, John, are you, are you feeling the effects of the? Uh, I know you're in radiation, but how are you doing on the on the hormone treatment? Are you starting to feel any of the Lupron legs and stuff? Yeah, the, the worst thing is probably uh, sweating at night in bed and you know driving my wife nuts by me getting up all the time and you're too hot or too cold and you you, know, you wake up and you, your bed's wet from sweat. But that sounds like a normal thing that every experiences. I'm into it now for about two months. So would you agree, Peter, is that pretty normal to have that kind of reaction? It not varies. I did not have that reaction. I had different reactions. But, that's, but, uh, but I have a buddy here who went through that for years. So it's, it's pretty common, night sweats. I remember you had a reaction to a liver issue. And I think I may have mentioned last time that a nurse looked at me and said, you really got to talk to your doctor about getting off of bicludamide because, you know, it's going to have an effect on your liver and you need to get off it, you know, right after your brachytherapy. And she had this kind of concerned look like, um, you know, they're following the protocols, but in reality, we're seeing a lot of patients who have liver issues, you know. So um, I wonder if anybody else had that same concern about, you um, and getting off by a clean mine in particular because of the uh, you know, adverse liver effects, which um, AST measures liver damage, I believe. So mm -hmm. don't like that word damage. Did, did you did you make an appointment or do, do you have a, an appointment with an oncologist there at UCSF while you're there? We retested it, and Dr. Roach said that, and, and it came back down to uh, – just a, a tad above the normal range. So it looks like we, it's not an issue any longer. Um, but if it is, I'll definitely follow through with Agarwal on so, that. I mean, do you agree if it's just two, two points above the normal range, not to worry about it? So I, I did have this experience. Uh, and I also had experience with heart sweats. My liver, my ALT and my AST were high all the time I was on front. And I I only did bicalutamide for the first two or three weeks as a buffer. And I remember Max saying to me at the time that was pretty unusual because men who are only on Lupron, he doesn't see that very often. But my oh, AST and my AST were elevated 
marginally elevated the whole time. They were all, I think they were up around that 12, 13 level the whole time that I was on for two years. And I always felt a little, I guess what in England they, they call it liverish. I like just slightly <laughs> sick and slightly nauseous and, and what have you. So um, it didn't bother Mac at all. We followed it. Um, and when I came off, eventually uh, my, my numbers came back down. So, you know, I, I, my, I, I, if it were me, I don't think I would bother with a medical oncologist. I, I, it, it wasn't severe enough and it wasn't elevated enough. A lot of times with these numbers, unless you're way over the limit, the doctors will say you don't really need to worry about it because it's a range. Um, now, yeah. as far as the hot sweats were concerned, I did have those same issues that you're talking about. And for most of the time I was on the, on the drugs and, you know, you, you just deal with it. I think one thing I yeah. would do now, I remember, by the way, in, in, I started in, November of 07, and in June of 08, there was a meeting, a research day meeting at UCSF. And I went up and asked Dr. Small about what should I take. And, um, and, and he recommended, um, just gone from my mind, what's the, um, what's the drug they always tell you to use for, um, for, for sweat? For, for, for hot for hot flushes, I look it up. But um, it's the one that um, it's the one that some of the advocates like Chuck Mack don't don't like. Um, okay. it begins with an M. Uh, well, I'll, let, let me look and I'll, I'll see whilst I'm talking. I'll look. Um, it's just gone from my mind for the second. But anyway. Uh, yeah. I didn't do anything. Now, one thing I would consider doing right now is acupuncture, because I think acupuncture can help you. And yeah, whether you can get an acupuncture, show, whether you can get an acupuncture treatment across the way at Osher or not, how long it would take to get that treatment. But you know, a lot of guys have reported that acupuncture makes a big difference. I'll, I'll send you afterwards, John. I'm making a note. I'll send you some stuff on hot flashes uh, yeah. th that I have. Anybody else? Want yeah, to I don't go a lot of. Go ahead, John. Yeah, you, like you say, it's a minor inconvenience, and I just feel lucky I haven't got it worse. I haven't had any kind of urinary or um, rectal effects from it, but I guess it, that happens later on. That uh, I'm only a couple weeks in, so. Um, so far, it's been great. People have been on time, very professional. I, I feel lucky to be here, and uh, uh, you know, so far, so good. Um, what um, What's your experience with with the nurses and the machinery and the actual experience of looking up at the stars and and all of that good stuff? Yeah, no, I, we, you know, we talked before about machines breaking down, so you need early morning appointments. Uh, they've been right spot on every, every, I'm there exactly 10 minutes early and drink my water and, uh, um, you know, they, um, they've been spot on time and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Roach actually showed up a couple of times and you know, gave me a fist bump and um, whatnot and uh, uh, the machines seem to work fine. I don't feel any discomfort whatsoever. But I gotta believe that's gonna change, you know, soon. Um, so I, I feel relatively lucky at this point. I mean, the sweats are a minor inconvenience, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, don't 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 be too sure that it's gonna change. You may you may be fine, you know. Some people sail through this stuff. Are you walking every yeah, day? It seems like oh, like like crazy. We're oh. we're. All the hills around my wife and I both walked to my treatment 25 minutes and walked back and uh, 
Uh, everybody seems to go through this, seems to say this common theme seems to be the exercise really seems to mitigate the effects best. So <laughs> we've been all over that. Well, I'm glad they're saying it now. They weren't saying that 10 years ago. It took a lot of work to get it, <laughs> I want to tell you. But uh, I love the fact that they're saying it now. Um, that That's really great. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah. let, let me let me throw it out to to those of you who are out there. What um, what about hot flashes? Anybody got any advice for um, for John on hot flashes? Just keep a fan on. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, yeah. That that's what I was going to say. After a while, you start to realize what things tend to trigger it. Uh, you know, sometimes here in Tucson, when the air conditioning first comes on with the ductwork overhead, the first air that comes out of that vent is hot. And when mm. as soon as that happens, on comes the, the hot flash uh, in the that? car. Yeah, in the car with the air conditioning on. And I'm <clears throat> fine and comfortable. I'll turn the corner. The sun comes through the window and hits me. It's a hot flash again. <laughs> yeah. So I did don't know exactly find, how yeah. to avoid those things, but. Yeah. Did you find that alcohol would uh, increase the, the sweating? I don't do alcohol. Yeah. I probably shouldn't either. <laughs> but that does seem to increase it. Yeah, you're right. Um, so the drug I was trying to remember the name of is Megase or Megastrol. And, Thank you, um, Megase. Okay. Yeah, so Megase is, is often prescribed, but there is controversy over it. Um, some people think that it, um, it may increase the production of uh, testosterone and estrogen. Um, okay. In particular, Chuck Mack, who is a, a a very he's an elderly and revered advocate who isn't that active anymore, but for years was sort of the go-to prostate cancer advocate, and he's written a paper. Um, I'm going to post it in the chat chat window right now, and I'll send it to you later. Um, but he's written a he's written a paper now. I will tell you that 10 years ago, Eric Small recommended that I try Megase. Um, Chuck uh, Mack talks about another drug which, um, which is also used, which he thinks is a better alternative, which is called Depo-Provera, D-E-P-O-P-R-O-V-E-R-A. Um, I'll, I'll put that in the chat window too. Um, but you know, uh, for me, I think if I would have known back then what I know now, I probably would have tried to get some acupuncture and started with that. Of course, okay. the, the problem with the acupuncture is that you have to do it every two or three weeks. So it's, it's not a permanent no. fix. But having said that, there are known acupuncture points for hot flashes. And so ah, I, I know I knew. Yeah. So you can go in and and like I say, you may well be able to get them to get it within the context of your um, your treatment by going across to Osher, um, which is out the front door and a little bit towards Geary on the west side of the street there um, on the corner is the OSHA center and go in there and, you know, they're, they're usually pretty busy. So I don't know how quickly you could get them, but that they would know about, they would certainly know about that. Sure, thanks, I'll give it a try. I've walked by that before. Okay. So, you know, that's, that, that, that's another, uh, and John, do, I, do, do, can you see that, um, uh, that link that I just posted for uh... I I just clipped it. I just highlighted it and clipped it. Okay, great. So you, have, uh, you don't need me to email it to you. 
No, got it. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, anything else, John, that you'd, you'd like to raise about your, your treatment right now? No, I uh, talked to my doctor who's going to do the uh, Rocky therapy, uh, Dr. Shu, and I mentioned what Peter had mentioned about the conference, the PCRI conference, the fact they weren't training many people in brachytherapy because it wasn't really a, a money make for the hospital, and uh, he went in a lot of detail about that, but they are under stress now, now that Albert Chang has left, so that's a little concerning that they're kind of shorthanded here, and they're, you know, putting a lot of operations in back-to-back, -back, so, uh, but it sounds like uh, they haven't had problems, and, and to make sure they haven't had problems, is there any place that you know to go just to look at track record? Is there any place that it comes out, or do you just have to ask the doctor I mean, how they're doing, track record, adverse results, um, those kinds of things, just to make sure that people aren't, you know, falling into the abyss here during this very busy time period they have? Well, I mean, th there is a medical care site there is a site but i think it's only for surgeons and i don't think brachytherapy is included on there but there is a site that you can go to that will um, allow you to check on the quality of your doctor for certain procedures um mm -hmm. i i would have to go look and dig it out i know i've got it bookmarked somewhere but I think it's only for surgeons, and it only applies to Medicare-approved procedures. And I don't think that brachytherapy is in there. Um, okay. Again, I, I, I don't think that you, you – it's like you say, you have to ask your doc. What have your results been? And you have to push your doc because they're rarely honest anyway, I hate to say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's also another support group, too, up in Marin that uh, I'm going to drop by and see if they have any feedback on that, too. So, um, You know, I know that, we'll, we'll do. as I told you, I know that support group, group intimately. I used to co-moderate that support group. Um, you know, they're not, the, the, what they're going to tell you is that, you know, maybe you should talk to Lloyd Miyawaki, who is a youth <laughs> trained radiation oncologist who now works at Marin General and who's a terrific guy and spends mm -hmm. an enormous amount of time with his, with each patient enormous he's a very very good guy and he's well liked by by the uh, Marin by the Marin prostate cancer group um, I don't think beyond that they, that Stan's going to have any ideas as to how you can check out your the, the history of your brachytherapy doc short of asking them for their results. I mean, there is no, yep. if you're looking for a, um, a national database, I don't think it exists. Yeah, it makes sense. I can safely say, well, it, it doesn't. I mean, it, it would make sense to have one, but I don't think you're going to find one because I, I don't think there's one out there. And I don't think yeah, they no, them up to date either um you know some of this some of the data is like a couple of years old often so it's, it's not it's not that good now john if, if, okay. you're, if you're into exploring support groups one of the ones i was very impressed with is 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 riding caltrain down to mountain view they have a monthly support group down there and you, then you have to take uber over to the uh, el camino hospital but uh, these guys, these guys are all engineers. They all have two-inch thick binders, and they sit around the table. There's about 30 of them um, with their computers and their two-inch binders, and they're, uh, they're it's, it's it's almost like going to a a, um, a medical convention. They're pretty up on on stuff. Uh, yeah, I heard I heard about that. I mean, several of the people that were in the one yeah. there at Mount Zion knew you, Rick knew uh, you, Peter, and Rick personally. They'd met you before. They'd been to PCRI and had really good good things to say when I talked about, you know, ANCAN. And, um, uh, you know, that's where they suggested these multiple groups are around because I just found a lot of benefit from this kind right. of a conversation, so. All right. Good. Well, I'd encourage you. 
I'd encourage you to attend any and all of them, but don't hold out um, that you're going to find the sort of resources that you'd like to find because your questions are good and these resources should be there. <clears throat> you know, we should have a national database for brachytherapy. We should have an easy way for people to find out what trials are appropriate for them at their stage of the disease, but we don't. And it, right now it just requires legwork and, and elbow grease and brain power. Um, that, that's just how it is. Yep, you're right. If you find anything new, be sure to share it with us, for goodness sake. <laughs> yeah, well, indeed. Thank you. Um, anything else for anyone else want to talk to John about what he's going through? Any thoughts, ideas? What are they telling you about your bladder? Are they telling you yeah, it has to be totally full? Are they telling you, you know, I know some people have to have, have to be drinking for two hours before they never t they never had me do that at UCSF. Yeah, no, they've kind of relaxed that requirement a little bit. It seems at UCSF, they really uh, just wanted the bladder to be in a consistent position every time. So I drank two glasses of water ten minutes before, just because they they kind of took me in early last time, and they want me to adhere to that regimen and drink two glasses of water every time I come in ten minutes before. So it sounds like it's more consistency than uh, you know separation between the bladder and the rectum, or between the, the prostate and the rectum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Last call for John Appler. Anybody want to talk to him? Okay, John. We'll, we'll talk to you then, and I will definitely be. I'll definitely be there from the 2nd to the 9th, so we'll figure out a time to get together. I'm buying the ahi steak. Okay, sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, Gary, I see that you have joined us. Is there anything you wanted to raise tonight? I don't have anything. I I just feel bad that I couldn't join you from the beginning. That's okay. Don't worry about it. And we'll post the we'll post the recording. Um, Larry, um, do you want to take? We've got we've still got about ten minutes. You you would you like to talk a little bit about the you know, decision that you're faced with and ask any questions to the group? Well, I um. I guess it's more, not much changed recently. I'm still in this, uh, it's kind of a limbo state between, between the um, first line of defense, Lupron, and whatever the second of line of defense is going to be, whether it's going to be uh, abiraterone or enzalutamide or some combination of something else with a as part of a trial. Mm -hmm. They withdrew about two months ago. You know, I stopped my, I had three doublings of my uh, PSA, like from 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.4. I don't even remember exactly. But anyway, and we, we just withdrew Casadex at that time. Mm -hmm. I stopped the Casadex and then I had dropped, and having dropped, my PSA started to drop again. And kind of went down to, I think, 0.16, they retested it, and then it went to 0.11. Now it's gone to 0.10, it's kind of leveling off. So I expect the PSA is going to start to rise again. And then um, we're going to look at the trials that are available. The, we looked at a couple of trials, but one of the criteria was the PSA had to be greater than 1.0. and there's another aspect is that, um, you know, the I'd gone into a diabetic state after a couple of years on Lupron, and you had to have uh, your uh, A1C had to be controlled. My A1C was a little high, mm -hmm. so I was I had to get my A1C down a little. Uh, right now, it's come down from 7.2 to 6.5. 
and my PSA also has gone down, so I'm not really eligible for the trials, the couple of two or three trials that we're looking at. Um, so I'm sort of in this limbo state. It's like playing a little bit of a game, I guess, waiting for your PSA to go up to 1.0 again while you fight to get the... Uh, I could take some other drugs to get my uh, A1C down, certainly, and then try to get into a trial because of the drug costs. Mm -hmm. And and um, that's where I am. I'm in that limbo state. I know you suggested uh, thinking about trying to do Prevenge, mm -hmm. or as I like to say, Prevenge during this period of time. Yeah. Uh, I haven't even seen my doctor yet because – we don't have an appointment until the PSA goes up again yet, although I could force an appointment. Right. Because Sloan right now is not is not uh, doing Prevenge. I would have to see if I could do that at another one of these – at another institution at the same time. And then we come up with the question of whether you had to be naive about Prevenge before you – in order to get into one or two of these trials that Sloan was – running mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and we have i haven't even gotten into that discussion yet so that's where i'm just really in that limbo i'm watching the the dropping the leveling off of the psa from the withdrawal of castex and i guess in a month or two it'll be rising mm -hmm. and then i'll be seeing my doctor mm -hmm. and wondering about playing this game my how long do i wait before I go on to the next level of Zytiga or, I mean, what's the risks involved? What's the right. – versus trying to get into a study? Right. I'm sort of sitting in that state of limbo. That's really where I am. Right. Well, well you know, one thing that um, I would recommend that everybody does at this point is um, – when I shouldn't say everybody, I would say all of those – all of you who are on Medicare – is to take a really good hard look at your program, at your Medicare supplement programs, understand them and decide what it is you think you need for the coming year. Because all the Medicare programs do have an option, all the Medicare supplement programs do have an option for you to access a doc anywhere, any place. And if, for example, you cannot access Provenge through um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and you would like to do Provenge, and you're eligible for Provenge, so it's not going to cost you very much, if anything at all, then you could easily switch and get an appointment from a different doc, say Dr. O, who, who Len is seeing at, um, at Mount Sinai. Um, and you know, the, I don't know what the cost of the programs are in in New York, but for example, the United Healthcare program in um, in Marin, and Marin is one of the most expensive counties in the whole of the country, is still under two hundred dollars a month um, for the supplement, plus the drugs, plus whatever you do on your drug program. So these programs are not vastly expensive in the overall scheme of things. I'm not trying to belittle $200, but, you know, for those of you who are not on Medicare, that sounds like, you know, that, that's the sort of price you'd give your right testicle for, provided you hadn't lost your left one. Um, and what I would recommend to all of you is take a really good hard look at those programs. Don't just don't just default into whatever you had this year into next year, because if you're somebody like Larry Fish, who's over 65 and has Medicare available to him and wants to get Provenge and can't get it through Memorial Sloan Kettering, then that's a pretty good way right now to find a solution to that problem. Yeah, I mean, my situation is a little more convoluted than that. Uh, First of all, I'm still working, so I'm not on Medicare Part B yet. Uh, I'm still on the Medicare through my work. I'm planning to be stopping very fairly shortly, 
but but at any time that I stop, I can switch to a Medicaid plus supplement plan. And I don't know if having Prevenge can be uh, an issue when you want to get into one of these studies that are looking at just the uh, early castrate resistant when you first become metastatic resistant right. from Lupron, if that's an issue in getting into the studies that we're looking at, I really want to review all that before I would look at the Prevenge. I, I, don't, think so. I, I don't think so. I've looked at a lot of the studies and usually Prevenge is not. The only issue where Prevenge can play in is if it's an immunotherapy trial. But if it's an anti antigen trial, I've never seen Prevenge precluding you from entering the trial. Right. So I'm trying to, I'm really trying to understand. So your the suggestion is that I certainly don't want to change from uh, my doctor at Sloan. Uh, so I'm gonna, I would go to see her and tell her that I was thinking about Prevenge. Let her give me her opinion. Uh, if it's all right with her, if she doesn't think it would conflict with her idea of a reasonable, I'd say her, I'd like to think about this idea and then go and look for a doctor just for that purpose and start with another med on completely just for the sense of going through a treatment of prevenge and then go back to my Sloan med on or be yeah. going to both of them at the same time. Is that the idea? No, I mean, I, I would, if, 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 if Memorial Sloan Kettering will not recommend Provenge for you because they don't recommend it to anybody, because for whatever reason they don't endorse it, and you say, I really want to get this treatment because I don't see the downside in it, which is probably a reasonable statement, because nobody's really come up with the downside in Provenge. The question is, does it really add anything? And if you feel that it could add and it could be helpful, then, and you ask for a referral, you say, look, I, I, I want to get it. Can you refer me to somebody just for getting Provenge, please? Yeah, you know, you know, at the, in the insurance I have now, that process is I have to go back to my primary care physician who then has to give me a referral that then has to be approved by my insurance company rather than I can't be sent through Sloan right. to somebody. Right. It's like I have, right. it's like a whole, it, it's a long, it's a kind of convoluted process. Instead, I could just wait a few months until I'm going to stop working and to go on to Medicare well, let, let, and me, then get this. Let, let me just ask yeah. you, what, what, um, what, what is your insurance costing you through your current employer a month? Oh, I think a uh, hundred bucks maybe. Okay. So you could, you could opt out and you could right, I can opt out. care right now. You right. I could. Employ. You could. And maybe the difference is a hundred dollars a month. Great. Well, I think it's about three. We go to about three hundred a month. The combination of Medicare is one twenty. The supplementals are about two hundred, and then the drug plan would be another hundred and something a month. And then there's the risk of going into and out of the donut hole, right. which could come to a number of thousand a year. Could get into five or ten thousand a year difference. Right, 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 right. I mean, the uh, vote is versus just risk. waiting a few months. We're thinking, we're, we're, that's what I say it's kind of alluded. We're, we're versus just waiting two or three months to see where I'm at. Okay. Well. Uh, so I was going to wait until I see my doctor one more time and then approach the Prevenge idea. Okay. So I didn't feel it was something I had to really rush at while my PSA was still at, you know, point one. Right. As long as I got to it before it reached. Point two or point three, or certainly below. Get it before, while it's still low, because of that concept of I think, if it's going to be effective, the burden, the cancer burden, is the issue. I think you're exactly right. I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. I think your thinking is exactly right, right. So that's why I say it's kind of a stage of limbo, and just okay. just sharing this with everybody. Any anyone want to contribute?
to the discussion? Any Rick, this is great. I have a, a question. Were you recommending that anyone who had a Medicare supplement start or can, should be looking around for a more open um, panel supplement? I, well, what I was saying was that if you're not happy with your current Medicare supplement, then now's the time to check it out. Right. Well, I don't know if it's just a Wisconsin rule or if I was fed something wrong, but I was told just today that once one signs up for a supplement, it's really hard for them to change. The only way I could easily change would be to move and then I could get an open like a United Healthcare, but otherwise, John would have to be underwritten, and the cost would would be no. very prohibiting. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I don't. Think, that, I don't no? think that's true. You you can you can switch during the open enrollment, which is October fifteenth to December seventh, and I'd be very very surprised if certain states limit you. Now, I may be wrong, and I don't have experience in Wisconsin, but it's widely, widely advertised that you can switch. If you wanted to switch during the year, other than between October 15th and December 7th, yes, it's very difficult. And you'd have I, to be- No, I was surprised to hear that too, because I thought open enrollment meant you could switch during that time. I would recommend you call United Healthcare and ask yep. them if there's anything specific about Wisconsin that allows you not to choose one of their plans during this period of time. They'll know in a heartbeat. Okay. And let us okay. know, Terry, because I think you'll find that you can change. And I would say, and I've said it before, because this is not medical advice, my experience has been that United Healthcare covers more covers more procedures and drugs more readily than anybody else. I can also tell you, as I said earlier in the call, I am having a devil of a time just trying to find a PCP with them right now and get it getting an appointment. Because I, I know a lot of people have used AARP and are very happy, and that's an open panel. Well, no, AARP is United Healthcare. Oh, AARP is United Healthcare. Okay, yes. well, good. But I heard about it. So if you if, if you go to AAR, if you if you enroll, yep. through a, you have to be an AARP member. But that yes. United Healthcare uh, supplement is what is offered through AARP, and it is very um, competitive. Yep. There are a lot of different options, and it's an excellent program. Who are you with right now? Well, we're with an HMO in Madison. Okay. Our supplement is with the HMO. We we're in the same place we were when we did not have Medicare. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the, there are pros and cons. I mean, I opted to go into an HMO PPO for a couple of months just because it was the end of the year. But next year, I um, for next year, I'm probably not going to, to take that. And there are some... So there are some tweaks that can reduce your cost. So, for example, if you're willing to absorb a small deductible and if you're willing to absorb 15% the 15 of any amount that, that a doctor, if a doctor does not accept Medicare, then you would have to absorb 15% of their cost and you're willing to take that risk, you can cut your cost down. Now, most doctors and certainly most all the doctors who are in the centers of excellence all accept Medicare. So, you know, maybe right. if you went right. to, if you went to somebody like uh, Dr. Turner in Marina del Rey, they probably don't accept Medicare and you'd have some exposure. But if right. you went to somebody at the University of Wisconsin or you wanted to see Alicia Morgans and uh, Western or what have you, they're all going to take Medicare so you don't have the exposure. I'm going to call United Health tomorrow. <clears throat> and can I just say one more thing real quickly? Yes. And I'm, I'm, I feel bad being the only woman on the call, but the gentleman that was speaking right before I started talking um, about Provenge, and he, 
he and John sound like they're in the same place and decisions have to be made. And I was very interested in hearing what he had to say and we'll be happy to hear what he does down the road. Okay, well, I'll, I'll connect the two of you afterwards and I'll send an email to the two of you and so you guys can talk. You can Sure, you can. Sherry, anytime. Yeah, that would be great because um, he just had his appointment today and you sound like you're both kind of in the same spot right now. He was told he wasn't high enough to go to, yeah, we, it's the same story we're hearing. And ProVrinch was talked about, but kind of not decided on. Um, so yeah, I was interested in your story. Okay, I'll make sure that you guys connect uh, um, afterwards, okay? Thank you. And, and Sherry, if, if I'm wrong on that, and Wisconsin is an outlying state that doesn't allow you to switch Medicare during the open enrollment period, would you please let me know? But I would be very, very, very surprised. Uh, I will. And I, I worked in insurance all my career, and I should know this. I was shocked when I was told we couldn't. But I'm going to call United Healthcare, and I'm going to call the Office of the Insurance the insurance commissioner tomorrow. Okay. Now, who told you, by the way? A, an independent agent who helps us with our Medicare Part D. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, let me know. I will. I will. I think that's crazy. <laughs> All I mean, right. I didn't. The right I didn't Jim, Jim yeah. Cameron. Yes, Jim. In Florida here, of course, they advertise Medicare commercials all the time and I know for a fact that uh, if you get in it what's known as an F plan and I, I, I'm in the AARP F plan I've never paid a nickel for all all, all the stuff that I've had done for the last four years in, in uh, on Medicare the AARP F plan I pay $225 a month for it and I don't, I don't pay a nickel more Right. I've never paid for anything. As long as the doctor is a Medicare doctor, you can go anywhere, any hospital, any facility, any doctor, and they pick up they pick up everything. You don't even yeah. get paperwork. And I can get AARP here in Madison. I just I I don't um I All chose not to about ten ten different plans, but the F plan is the their their top plan. That covers absolutely everything, including. But you need. Do you need the drug plan then? Do you need a separate? Drug I have to buy a. I have to buy a separate drug plan. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I buy a. I buy a drug plan through uh, Cigna, and that okay. I have to watch to make sure that the drugs that I that I need are, are yeah. in that plan. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. But the medical plan, the, the, the United Healthcare through ARP F plan, I mean all the stuff that I've had done, it, it I, I haven't pay, I haven't paid a nickel. Wow. I'll be checking that out tomorrow. Okay, so do you have a pencil there, Sherry? Yes. So here's the here's the number for um for United Healthcare ARP. It's all right. 800-643-4845. Yeah. Yep. I'll be checking this out and let you know what they say. Good. How's that for service, huh? Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Great, Rick. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. We're running late. We're eight minutes over. Um, so it's time to close, and I'll speak to you all, God willing, uh, Tuesday, a week uh, tomorrow, a week tomorrow. Okay? Okay, thanks, okay. Rick. Thanks, Rick. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care, everybody. Bye. Yep.